could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But... If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The Father is seeking worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. Let us sing to the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design, in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roam the earth, yes, with the power of his promise in their hearts. faith and not by sight. Sing by faith. By faith the prophets saw a day when the long for Messiah would appear with the power to bring the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the The church was called to go in the power of the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach to you in every corner. shall be moved. By faith this mountain shall be moved. And the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know, for we know in Christ all things are possible. For those who call upon his name, we will stand as children.
And so as we walk by faith, we, we encounter not just who God is, but who we truly are, the brokenness in our own selves. And maybe this morning as you're coming in, you're going through brokenness of someone else in your life, and you're dealing with their failures, and you're, having, you're being tempted to deal with their failures in a sinful way, in a way that's actually more broken and worsening the problem. Maybe you're a kid, and as you drove to church, you were fighting with your siblings in the seat next to you not speaking for anyone in particular in this room. <laughs> Maybe I am. But whoever we are, this is the call of Jesus to come and confess and repent, not so that God would someday forgive us, but because he already has. He has given us everything we need in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I'd encourage you, put your eyes on the screen and let's read this prayer together, praying by faith in our hearts faith in not in ourselves, but in the Son of God who came to seek and save the lost. Let's pray this prayer. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The call is for all sinners to come and find healing in the blood of Jesus.
Heavenly Father, you are our good shepherd, the shepherd of our souls. And this morning as we come, may we find peace at your table. May we find joy with your people. May your spirit pour out all of, those, all of that fruit for which our hearts truly desire. Love and joy and peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus, be with us as we are together in your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take our seats. Good morning. So a couple of announcements. I'll let Josh kind of fill in the first one. So uh, day of thanks, we always do Thanksgiving weekend um, where we, we provide some video, whether it's from missionaries or from specific people in our church. And Josh is working on a project now. So if you want to share, Josh. Yeah, so uh, it should be on. Is this on? Nope. There it is. Uh, it's real simple. What I would love to create for us for the day of thanks is a little video where each person in our church, literally I'd love to have everyone, send like a 10 to 20 second video of a selfie saying, hi, my name is, and this year I'm thankful for, just on your phone. And then I'll, I'll put them all together and then we'll put them all, you'll bring them all to me. But it's just important that you, when you film yourself, make sure it's not like by a busy street where kids are playing, where we can't actually hear you. Make sure that it's a quiet spot. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. And make sure it's landscape, right? Not portrait, like Josh did in the newsletter. That's, that's less of an issue than the sound. <laughs> sure. All right. And so, um, so Thanksgiving morning, uh, the, the Y does a turkey trot. There's li literally thousands upon thousands of people here for that. Uh, as a church, uh, every year we, we go out and we provide water that has CBC labels on it and and, and staff to be able to do that. And I know the last couple of years, it seems like uh, our volunteers have, have trickled down. And so we really do need help. It's Thanksgiving morning, it's not real uh, long. Um, and so you'll be back home plenty of time to do all your cooking and everything else. Um, but that'll be that morning, I think at 6.30, 6, 6.30, uh, to be here and to hand out water. Um, uh, so we need people Thanksgiving morning for that. Uh, normal week this week, as far as men's Bible study, women's Bible studies, small groups, all of that stuff. Uh, but a couple of things coming up. So Wednesday, November 30th, uh, for the ladies at the Life Center, uh, 7 p.m., uh, they'll be having a, a, the ladies' Christmas party kind of to end the, the, the year. Um, and then starting December 1st, so Thursday, December 1st, will be December 1st, 8th, and 15th. Um, their children's choir will be uh, rehearsing there at the office. And so uh, that'll be at 6 p.m. On, on the 1st, 8th, and 15th. And then they'll be singing on the, at the service on the 18th. Um, let's see what else we have. Okay, so uh, if, you've, if you left a pair of wireless Beats headphones uh, here, so I think it's a couple of weeks ago, Rick said, just see Rick in the back, he's got those. Um, he needs a charger for him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, if you left them, Rick has them, so uh, just identify them. Sell them back to you. <laughs> yeah, they'll sell them back to you cheap, though. Um, cheaper than you bought them for. Uh, and then um, last week, uh, we had a number of new people working and helping with some of the, the breakdown stuff. After, and we've, we've misplaced the computer. So we are short one computer. Um, yeah, MacBook. And so... Uh, we don't think somebody stole it. We just think that it just got put in a box that we're not sure which one it is. So if you can, uh, if, if, just go back to the back there, any of those guys on the production team, uh, just tell them where you put it. That would be great. Uh, all right. If you're visiting with us, thank you uh, for coming this morning. Uh, if you would, just take a minute. There's a seat back uh, uh, card in the seat back pocket in front of you. Uh, fill that out. You can give it to me at the end of the service, uh, or you can put it in our tithe and offering box there in the back. Uh, but let's take a few minutes, say hello to the work folks that have come to worship alongside of us this morning.
we come back to our seats, we're remembering that God is the one who set everything in motion. The Lord of all creation. Lord of all creation. Of water, earth, and sky. Heavens are your
take our seats. Let's pray together. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our stronghold, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, Selah. Our Father, what wonderful promises you give us. The God who is trustworthy and faithful in spite of a world that's crumbling. The morality has become immorality. We've become a nation of unblushables. Seems like nothing surprises us or shames us anymore. And yet, you will build your church. The gates of hell won't prevail over it. And so, Father, we gather this morning as a church, as the body of Christ, as your bride, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to open your word, this very gift that you've given us, that by it we might walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. And so use your word this morning, save the lost, sanctify the saved, do the work in us that's needed that we would be more like Jesus. We ask this in his name, amen. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Genesis chapter three. Genesis three. Journals, Genesis journals are page 17. If you don't have a journal, there's probably still some left in the back there. Last week, we finished the first of the four major events uh, in the book of Gen Genesis. Remember, we, we identified those four events as creation, fall, flood, and nations. And so we finished creation last week. Uh, today's passage in Genesis 3 is, is probably uh, the most tragic chapter in all of the Bible. Uh, we, we saw the, the beauty of God's per perfect creation uh, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. But Genesis 3 is different. Genesis 3 is why we have death and disease and suffering and pain. In fact, all the horrors of the world we live in is, is the fruit, it's the result of what happened in Genesis 3. And so I'm just going to share a couple of very personal stories here. I had a really good friend of mine named Brett Kenny. Brett was disabled. He was 34 years old and he'd been disabled for 29 years. Uh, as a five-year-old, he had uh, taken a fall and, it, and he had brain damage as a result of it. And it, it caused the left side of his body to be paralyzed. Uh, Brett was in our Sunday school class. He was a good friend, like I said. Uh, he played on our church softball team, even though his, only half his body would, would work. And so uh, Brett was our pitcher. And so he could pitch with one side, and then one of us would stand in front of him to make sure if any line drive up the middle, we'd be able to cover Brett for that. Um, one night, Brett was at his home, and he was a, a abducted uh, by a drug-addicted couple. Uh, they mugged him um, for $250, all he had in his account, uh, to buy their drugs. And then for the next two days, they beat him and stabbed him uh, until he died and they dumped his body uh, in the woods. This was pure evil. 
And you go, why would something like that happen? Genesis 3. A few years ago, this godly couple that Sherry and I had the privilege of discipling them when they were in high school, um, went to wake up their one-year-old daughter to get her ready for church, only to discover her lifeless body in the crib. Why? Genesis 3. And this happened shortly after the mom in her early 30s was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. These are the things that happen to good, godly Christian people. And it's heart-wrenching. I mean, last month, Hurricane Ian devastated Florida. Uh, this week, Hurricane Nicole, uh, we got a bit of a tropical storm from that. Why? Genesis 3. Our world is, is filled with death and disease and destruction and de despair and evil because of Genesis 3. This week, you know, and, and you think, you think nothing shocks you anymore. But I was shocked this week to see that there are people in some of our states that voted for doctors to have no obligation whatsoever to save a baby who's born alive. That is wicked. It is absolutely wicked. It's evil. Why? Genesis 3. Prior to Genesis 3, there's no anxiety. There's no anger. There's no irreconcilable differences. Prior to Genesis 3, there's no gossip. There's no pain. There's no adultery. There's no abuse. There's no murder. There's no disease. There's no death. After Genesis 3, that's the normal part of the world we live in. That is what we face day in and day out, and it's not getting better. Okay, it's getting worse. And so let's just read our passage this morning, and then we'll go back and pick it apart verse by verse. Genesis 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the, fruit of the tree, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree of the garden which is in the middle, of, I'm sorry, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in, in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. And when the, woman, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that it was, the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. That's where it started. Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, we see God speak over and over and over again. End of Genesis 2, we see Adam speak. Remember, we talked about that last week. You know, this, he, God brings him Eve, and he breaks out in spontaneous song. Wow, look what you've given me. What a wonderful wife, or what a wonderful gift uh, this wife was for Adam. And now in Genesis 3, after hearing God speak, after hearing Adam speak, uh, Satan, the father of lies, speaks. And what we're going to find is when he speaks, he gives us a blueprint for the way that he does his work. We're going to see what he does with temptation and sin. Because the same approach that he used with, with Eve in the garden is, is the approach that he uses on us today. And when God created Eve on, on day six, or Adam and Eve on day six, they were the crown jewels of his creation. And, and then he places them in this beautiful garden and he gives them dominion over the creation. Every blessing imaginable was theirs. I mean, everything was just right. Think about it. Adam and Eve, they're in perfect unity. They've got a beautiful place to live. They, they were the apple of God's eyes. They've got a job. They've got purpose for their lives. Can you imagine then what Lucifer, what Satan must have been thinking? Because he'd been kicked out of heaven. He was the one that was cast down to earth. Can you imagine what he's thinking now to see God being so kind to them after all that God had done to him? 
because he wanted to be like God. He wanted God's authority. He wanted to be worshiped like God. And now these creatures were made in the image of God. They were the apple of his eye. God gave them dominion over creation. Look at verse one. We're just gonna start working through little by little. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. You know, in order to, to best fight our enemy, we need to know our enemy. And so let's take a, before moving on to the rest of the text, let's, let's understand a little bit about who Satan is. Let's understand a little bit who our enemy is and how he works. Uh, you'll see, you'll hear me use the term Satan or Lucifer or star of the morning or son of the dawn uh, today or the serpent. Uh, it's the same person. And so let's look, point number one, if you're taking notes, the personhood of the enemy. Okay, the personhood of the enemy. You know, this was a real reptile. And we can assume that, that this reptile, this snake, this serpent, was in an upright position because it wasn't until God cursed the snake that he would forever be on his belly. And it says that he was more crafty than the beasts of the fields. Now, the, the word crafty in the Hebrew, it means skillful. Um, it means uh, clever. You, you could use that word to talk about um, like having a, a being subtle and cunning and, and devious. And so what Satan did is he manipulated this animal to use him as a way to, to speak to Eve. And you go, well, how do you know it's Satan, right? Because it just says serpent here. It doesn't say Satan. How do we know it's him? Well, look at Revelation 12, verse 9. It says, and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan. What does he do? He deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. You go, well, do we have evidence of that? Well, we do. There's two primary passages that speak of, of his rebellion and his, and his fall from, from heaven. The way I like to think about it is a 14 and 28. Two 14s is 28, 14 times 2. 28. So it's, it's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. And, and you'll see his name is called Lucifer. Okay? It, it, Lucifer means star of the morning or, or light of the dawn. He was created as the anointed cherub. Okay? He was the most beautiful of the angels. His job as the anointed cherub was to reflect God's glory. So you go, man, if he had all of that, like, why would he leave that? You know, what happened there? Well, Isaiah 14, we'll start in verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down from, to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. Well, it still doesn't tell us why, though, right? Except he's going to tell us. This is why he was, he was cast down. He says, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. By that word, that, that, way, that word stars of God there, the angels. So he says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will raise my throne above the angels of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. And so rather than honoring God and glorifying God and doing what God had created him, to, to do, he wanted the glory of God. He wanted to be worshiped. He wanted it all to be about him. And when he rebels against God, one third of the angelic realm follow him. We call them demons. And so you've got the, the, the father of lies, Satan himself, and this demonic army with him. And they have a passion to destroy the crown jewel of God's creation, you. And he will do whatever it takes. In fact, when you, when you get to, to, to travel to different places around the world, you, you see the, the, the subtlety and the craftiness in the way that he works. You know, in, in South Africa, they have a lot of witch doctors and, and voodoo type of stuff, and, and the goal is, is to keep the people oppressed Keep the people afraid so that they, they can control them. Right, because if you can control them, then it keeps them away from God. In a country like ours where we have so much wealth, 
He doesn't use fear to control us. He uses ease to control us. I mean, we don't really have a need for God, right? I mean, we got food in our refrigerators. We got food in our freezers. We have gas in our cars. We got working air conditioners. Well, sorry, Josh. Most of us have working air conditioners, right? <laughs> it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to get into heaven. Satan doesn't mind you rich. He just wants to keep you from God. His tactics are, are broad. I mean, it could be your intellect. It can be your comfort. It can be your bad experience with church. It could be the fact that you just think you're a good person and you don't need God. It, it really doesn't matter to him. He just wants to destroy the crown jewel of God's creation, which is you. And so there's this war that's, that's going on in the invisible realm between God and Satan, and the war is for you. And, and Satan is, de is, is determined to destroy the human race and the relationship that we have with God. But how encouraging is it to know that he's a defeated foe? Like there is coming a time when, when God is gonna bind him for a thousand years and before he lets him out for one final try to, to destroy humanity. And then his final doom, Revelation 20 says it. Look at Revelation 20 verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's his final doom. And so our enemy is powerful, but he's doomed to an eternity of torment. And he has a framework for the fall that we're gonna see in Genesis 3 that, that, that I think if you, if you see it the way I see it, it's the same thing that happens in my life every day. And so let's look at point number two, the pattern of temptation. You know, as we, as we look at Satan's personality and his desire to destroy us, we see in this text that the pattern by which he tempts us to sin. Let's look at verse one again. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. This is a subtle attack. And the attack is on God's goodness. And the way that he's going to attack God's goodness is to get Eve to start doubting his word. Eve, did God really say that? Eve, are you sure that you heard what you think you just heard? And so point A in, in his, the way that he uses temptation is to get you to doubt God's word. Doubt God's word. That's step one. Did God really say that you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. Eve, did God really say, like, no, you can't even eat? How does he expect you to eat if you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Eve should have said, no, he didn't say that. In fact, Genesis 2, verse 16, look what he did say. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. So, so God put them in this beautiful lush garden. There's four rivers running through it. I'd, if I had to guess, I'd say there's probably thousands upon thousands of trees. And I would think that there's probably hundreds of thousands of pieces of fruit that they could eat and enjoy. But God, to, to, to demonstrate that they trusted God, he left one tree in the middle of the garden not for, them, for them not to eat from. Thousands that they could and one they couldn't. God, when he presents it, he says, look at all these trees and fruit that I have for you. Satan says, look at that, how selfish God is. Look what he's keeping from you. God's holding out on you. God doesn't love you. So he distorts Eve view, Eve, Eve's view of God by getting to her to question God's character by doubting his word. I mean, we, we've dealt with that throughout this, this series so far. It took us nine weeks to get through the first two chapters of Genesis. Did God really say six days? Yeah, six days. Is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Only? I mean, isn't that a little bit narrow-minded? Does God really want us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you? I mean, would a good God really do that? 
Would a good God really want you to consider others as more important than yourself? You see, the devil has a plan for, for your fall, and, and the first part of that plan is to get you to doubt God's word. And, and so rather than, than having God's word as a standard for right and wrong, Satan is telling Eve, you can kind of pick and choose from God's word. You can keep the stuff you like and throw out the stuff you don't like. By the way, that's what Thomas Jefferson did. The Jefferson Bible. There's things he didn't like, and so he just kind of cut those out and took them out of there. He wants you to be, rather than, than God's word being over you like this, he wants you to be over God's word. You judge. You get to determine what you want and what you like and what you don't like. He wants you to think that you can fulfill the I wills that he won't. Look at verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. Does anyone else find it ironic that Eve is arguing with an animal she has dominion over? It's like parents arguing with their three-year-old over why they can't have sour straws for breakfast. You're the parent. Just say no. Like, you don't have to debate that. It's not an argument. You have authority. And once Satan gets her to doubt God's word, the next thing he does is he gets her to twist, or he starts to twist God's word, which is point B. He twists God's word. Look at verse 3. But from the fruit of, fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Hey, did God say anything about touching the fruit? No. Didn't say anything about touching it. By the way, we, stop saying Eve ate the apple. It wasn't an apple. Okay, it just says fruit. Uh, and, and I think, I wonder what the conversation was with Adam. Because God didn't say not to touch it. Maybe Adam was like, hey, Eve, you know, he's, he's just basking in, in her beauty and, and how wonderful it is that, that he's not alone. And, and they're walking through the garden. Look, uh, look at all that God has given us and, and this fruit. And I really like this one. I really like this one. And wow, this one tastes so sweet when it goes down. It's so smooth. And, and, but listen, Eve, that tree in the middle there, God said, don't eat of that one. Well, like, what do you mean don't, don't eat of it? No, no, don't eat of it. Like, don't, we're not to eat that. We can eat all the other ones, but, but don't eat that one. That, that's our proof that we love God, that we're not going to eat that. And, and listen, if this was, I'll just put me. If this was me, you know, I'd say, can I touch it? Can, can I lick it a little bit? I mean, I'm not eating, right? I'm just, I'm just close. I can just picture Adam going, you know what? It's just best. Don't, don't even touch it. By the way, that would be good advice. But see, once you start to doubt God's word, then you also begin to doubt God's character. And, and could it be that maybe Eve's going, oh, God's kind of strict. There's all these rules. I can't even touch the tree. You see, the moment you start thinking that God is keeping something from you, Rather than keeping something for you, you're back in the garden. You're Eve at the tree, arguing with a snake. And when God's word is twisted and God's word is doubted, you are in the most dangerous place you can ever be in. And you are right where Satan wants you. And so Eve starts focusing on the fruit. But it's focusing on the fruit she can't have rather than focusing on the fruit she could have. One word to describe her, discontent. Listen, it is so easy to sin when you are focused on the few things you don't have rather than seeing all the blessings that you do have. And when you do that, you've taken the bait. Just like Eve. Now, now look how Satan counters Eve, verse four. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. This is the first lie in the Bible here. And then, you know what the lie is? There's no judgment. There are no consequences. You can sin and it won't matter. He says, you surely will not die. 
You won't get caught. It's not a big deal. Everybody's doing it. Nothing's going to happen. And it is a lie straight from the pit of hell. In fact, look how Satan continues, verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Can you see how he's twisting God's word? They're already made in the image of God. This is exactly what he said when he got thrown out of heaven. I will be like the most high. God doesn't want you to be like him. You won't die. God's holding out on you. God's selfish. Satan is a master at twisting God's word and setting you and I up to fall. And so let's look at point number three, the process of sin. The process of sin. And what we see in the temptation of Eve is the normal tactic that the enemy uses even today in our lives. Look at verse six. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Now the best interpreter of scripture is more scripture. If we want to interpret scripture well, we need more scripture. And so what we're going to do is we're going to see how Satan's process in getting you to sin is, is, is found consistently throughout the scriptures. It starts here in Genesis 3, but we're going to find it all through the Bible. And it begins with the first uh, uh, blank here, A, is desire. The first stage in the process of sin is desire. It's you wanting something that you shouldn't have. James 1, verse 14, it says, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by what? His own lust. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. It's our own lustful desires that entice us to sin. Listen, no doubt Satan knows where we're weak at. He, he dangles it in front of us. But it, it says here, he says, carried away and enticed in James 1. That, that first word is, 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 is a term that a hunter would use to, to ensnare a, an animal in a trap. And the, the second word is a, is a word that a fisherman would use to, to lure a, a fish with bait. Satan knows what your flesh wants. Satan knows what you've fallen prey to before. And he has a plan for you. And he chooses the bait that you find most attractive. The thing that you desire most. And and some of the things that you desire, I I don't desire. It's not a struggle. Some of the things I struggle with, you don't struggle with. Uh, For instance, if right now you offered me cocaine, it's not a temptation. It's just not. I've I've never tried it. I've never been around somebody that I know of that's been doing it. So I've never, never actually seen it. Uh, I, I don't know anything about it. So it's not a temptation for me at all. For others in here, huge temptation. Huge temptation. You, you would be enticed by your fleshly desires. Look how John describes the desires that lead to sin. First John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. He says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Do you see the pattern in here? You have the lust of the flesh. That's the desire to indulge. And then you have the the lust of the eyes. That's the desire to have. And then the pride of life is the desire to impress. Every sin begins there. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You either will desire to fulfill some fleshly desire you have or something uh, that you want to feel or you will desire being somebody that you're not yet. We, We say it here all the time, right? I do what I do. Because I want what I want. 
I do what I do because I want what I want. It's, it's a heart issue. It's a desire issue. And, and Satan knows what you desire. And, and our desires ultimately are what lead to our downfall. Because from our desires, point A is point B, deception. We, we get deceived when we start believing the lies. And we start believing that, that are we giving, giving ourselves permission to, to, to move further? And so deception would say, uh, just, just this one time. I'm just going to try it. N- nobody's going to know. I mean, I, I deserve this, right? I can stop at any time. And, and you know, God's blessing me, so, so I, I, maybe it's not even bad. Or I can always ask for forgiveness later. You see, sin, what it does, it takes the opportunity, Paul said, and it deceives you. And so it's one thing to have desire and deception. But if you had desire and deception without opportunity to sin, then the sin just fades away. Example, I had a couple of high school students a number of years ago confessing that, oh, we went too far and, and, and couldn't stop. And I said, if her daddy walked in, could you stop? Oh, yeah, it stopped then which is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation, he says, has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. The way of escape is the way of righteousness. God always has a way of righteousness for you. He always has a righteous way to escape for you. And the biggest lie that we can believe is that we sin alone, God's not even around. When in reality, it's how could you do that with me standing here? We think we're in private. We think that nobody will know, and it's really a shallow view of who God is. It's part of the deception that temptation is. And so you have desire, you have deception, and then point C is disobedience. Disobedience is what happens when desire and deception take hold and you refuse to take the way of escape that God has for you. I like how James says it, James 1, verse 15, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So so each one, think about this now, right? The first verse, each one is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then he says, and when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When lust is conceived, disobedience happens. And so the sin actually starts in the imagination before it moves to behavior. Think about it this way. What you flirt with, you will eventually fall for. The area you hang around in will eventually become your life. Proverbs uh, 23, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he becomes. What you're dwelling on is who you will be. And so first Eve desired, then she was deceived, and that's when she disobeyed. And what happens when lust gives birth to sin? What does sin bring? The last D, death. The price for sin is always death. It's death to our conscience. It's death to our sanctification. It's death to our relationship with God and with others. That's the normal pattern. Remember when, when Israel was in the wilderness and, and they had defeated Jericho, moving into the promised land, and, and, and God said, don't take anything, right? Don't take anything from this land, from, from this city. And, and, and Achan took, right? And so, so they go to their next battle of Ai, and, and I used to tell my high school students, a little podunk two-letter town, um, so they go to Ai and, and, they, and they lose this battle. Like, how do you beat Jericho and lose to Ai? And, and God told uh, Joshua, somebody took something. So they narrow it down to Achan and his family. And Joshua's like, why would you do that? I mean, we just spent 40 years in the wilderness. God is so faithful. We march around seven days and blow trumpets. And next thing you know, the whole city falls down. It's all ours. God said, don't take. Why would you take something? Joshua 7, verse 20. So Achan answered Joshua and said, 
Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I did when I saw. That's desire. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted. That's the lust of the eyes. Then I took them. And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. And there you have it. Desire, deception, disobedience, and death. And you go, well, there's no death. I didn't see any death. If you keep reading, everyone was stoned to death related to this man. His wife, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys. I mean, the donkeys got to be like, what did I do? The price for sin is always death. Adam and Eve died. David, his children all died, right? Be- because of his sin with Bathsheba. Achan died, his whole family died, and death comes to us as well. By the way, we said the best interpreter of scripture is just more scripture, right? This is the same pattern that the evil one used with Jesus in the wilderness. Look at Matthew chapter four. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry, which is kind of funny, isn't it? After 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, Command that these stones become bread. This is the lust of the flesh. Jesus, you've been fasting for 40 days. You're hungry, right? You have the desire to indulge. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, by the way, you could write the word since there, since you are the son of God, Throw yourself, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will, they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Lust of the eyes. You won't get hurt. God's going to protect you. Nothing's going to happen to you. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you, I will give you if you fall down and worship me. It's the pride of life. Jesus, I'll make you somebody. You get all the kingdoms of the world at your disposal. And how did he respond? Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The, the difference between Eve's temptation and Jesus' temptation is that each time Jesus responded, he answered with the word of God. It was the exact opposite of Eve. Look what she says, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, right? I'm hungry. Looks good. The desire to indulge. And that it was a delight to the eyes. Lust of the eyes, right? Desire to possess. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. You're telling me I'll be smart? I'll be like God? I'm going to be somebody? It's the pride of life. So she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Here's what I know for sure. Right now, you're being tempted in the same way. The enemy knows what you want. He knows what you're discontent about, and he's working you. He he is... He is planning your demise. He is appealing to to you to to indulge in your fleshly desires because he hates you. Jesus said Satan's goal is to steal, to kill, and to to destroy. And and it doesn't matter to him how he does that, but he's going to do it. That's his goal. You go, I've got good friends around me. So did Eve. There's Adam literally standing right next to her. It doesn't even seem like he hesitated, does it? Look what it says. She took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Hey, this is pretty good. And he ate. 
In fact, Paul told Timothy that, that Eve was deceived. But Adam wasn't. Adam sinned with his eyes open. Adam knowingly did, without any deception at all, what he knew God had told him not to do, and then he thought he could hide. And they didn't do any of the big things, right? There's no murder, there's no rape, there's no extortion, there's, there, there's no uh, stealing, right? What, did, what is their sin? They doubted God's word and ate a piece of fruit that God said not to. And you go, well, that's not that bad. Agreed. But do you look at it the other way? Wow, how holy our God must be. That he can't even allow the, the smallest disobedience to be in his presence. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. The moment they ate, they experienced physical death. I'm sorry, spiritual death. Physical death is the, the absence of life, right? Spiritual death is be the absence from the life giver, separation from the life giver. Their fellowship with God was broken. Kind of ironic, isn't it? Satan never told them what they'd lose. He never reminded them of the wages of sin. And the moment they ate, their bodies started the aging process. And they would eventually end, uh, die physically. And we're going to see next time that all of creation was cursed at this point. I'm just speculating, but I, I just wonder if, 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 if you've got all these animals around them, right? They're just, they're just hanging because, because they're, they're, Adam and Eve had dominion over them and, and, and everything's friendly. And I wonder when, when Adam took a bite, if like all of a sudden the animals ran away and hid like, we do, like they do from us. I, I wonder if the lions suddenly started roaring or the bees started stinging, or the mosquitoes started biting. I wonder if some of the mountains turned into volcanoes and started erupting. I wonder if in that moment, suddenly rose bushes grew thorns. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. It's exactly what God said would happen. And Satan had convinced them that they could eat of the fruit and nothing would happen. And listen, may, maybe that's you today. Maybe you're, you're deceived like Eve. Maybe you have a plan to indulge in sin. And it doesn't bother you. You're just going to do it anyway. Just like Adam. God made Adam to be the head, but instead he was being led. And when he ate, they went from being naked and unashamed to being naked and very ashamed. And you might be here going, man, that's just not fair. That's not fair. My, my kids will tell you what I say when they say that's not fair. I say, life's not fair, get over it. It's not fair. Here's the reality. We were born into this world with a sin nature and there's no opting out of it. You can complain about it. You can say that God wasn't fair. You can say that he should, never should have created Satan or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can say that. Problem is you're not God. I'm not God. And the reality is we can't sit here and ignore this and somehow think that we're not accountable. Adam and Eve placed their desire above God's will that's it. And, and listen, and that's what we do. So we can blame them all we want, but we're just like them. We actually think that a forbidden fruit tastes better than trusting God. We think that we're going to find life among death. We think that we're going to find blessing rather than judgment. We think that we're going to find joy in the midst of sorrow and suspicion. We think that we're free. Poor slaves. We think we know better than God does, and we're wrong. He created us. And then when we sin, you know what we do? We sew fig leaves together to cover up our guilt, and we hide. Really, what a shallow view of God it is to think that we can cover up our sin from the one who sees everything. Adam and Eve started the hiding process 
And I think we've perfected it. We're pretty good at it. We have the fig leaf of religion. And we think that we can cover up our sins by going to church or doing religious things. And the story of the garden is that God is so holy that he can't allow any sin into his presence. There has to be a covering for sin. And fig leaves of philosophy or fig leaves of good works or fig leaves of religion, they won't do it. Like it or not, our God is a God of wrath and a God of justice. Sin is so serious that the payment for it is death. But then there's a flip side to this as well, right? Not only is God a God of wrath and a God of justice, he's a sovereign and loving and holy God. And he knew Adam and Eve would sin before they sinned. And he made provision for their sin before they sinned. Which is our last point, point number four, the payment of Christ. In Revelation 13, John calls Jesus the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So he knew they'd sinned before they sinned, and he put the plan in place to redeem them of their sin. Romans 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages or the price of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, their eyes were opened. They saw they were naked. And, and did you see what they did? They immediately went to hide. This is, this is evidence of the conscience. This is the first time you see the conscience in Scripture. Nakedness came, and shame came right behind it. And they knew they were naked, and they needed a covering. God himself is that covering. God is the one who provided the covering. The God who set the penalty of death for sin literally died for sin. Ephesians 1, verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he, I love that word, lavished on us. If you have never trusted in what Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection from death, you're still in Genesis 3. You're still fig leaf religion. And I, and I would just beg you, turn to Christ. There is, there is no amount of fig leaves that will cover your sin. John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that you may have life and have it abundantly. You know, be, before we go to prayer, I, I just want, I want to read, last night as I was, just last review before this morning, I'm going back through my notes and and I, and I went to look at, at what songs we were doing afterwards. And, uh, and we're going to sing the song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. We didn't have a staff meeting this week, so Josh and I literally never talked about this. But listen to the words. Come behold the wondrous mystery. He, the perfect son of man, in his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam, Come to save the hell-bound man, Christ, the great and sure fulfillment of the law. In him we stand. Let's pray together. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the very righteousness of God in him. He himself is the satisfaction of the propitiation for our sins not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And so if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Father, in the midst of, of death and sorrow, in the midst of sin, we see this bright light of salvation. And so I pray for those in here this morning, a few different groups, maybe those who are like Eve and they're being deceived into thinking that whatever sin it is that's in front of them is better than what you have. God, I pray that you would give them the truth of your word through your spirit. Father, I pray for those in here who are like Adam, who have a plan to sin. They know what they're going to indulge in and they don't care. God, I thank you that for those of us who are believers in here, that you discipline us. You love us enough to discipline us. 
And so, Father, I pray that for those that you would do that work in them, those things that you know they need to bring about repentance. And there's a group that don't yet know you. They might have been in church their whole lives, but they don't know Christ. They know the details about salvation, but they don't know Jesus. I pray that today that they would understand that it's grace that they're saved through faith. It's not by their own works. It's a free gift that you give so that none of us can brag other than bragging that you saved us. So Father, thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the work that he did to redeem us. We humbly bow before you, submitting to your will and to your ways. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we close our service this morning. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Thank you. 
And with that hope set before us, let us behold not ourselves, let us not focus on what we don't have, the things that we wish in our fleshly desires we had. Let us remain focused on the things that have been given to us, lavished upon us, which is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.